Good morning, everyone. I know people are just coming into this webinar, but I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Lena Toled of WRAL and your host for today's conversation, exploring the COVID-19 vaccine. Today, you're gonna to get the opportunity to hear from leading black health experts on the vaccine, including the woman who played a major role in creating one of the vaccines, Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, we will also be honoring her today, so that's very exciting. The Congregation of Peace Missionary Baptist Church is so thrilled to welcome you today. And we have your questions that you sent in, and we certainly intend on asking them. Look, you don't need me to tell you, it's been an incredibly challenging time for our communities, uh, particularly the Black community during the pandemic, disproportionately affected. I know you've heard this both in terms of our health, uh, getting infected by COVID-19 and dying more from this virus and economically as well. So we're hoping right now in this moment of transition where we have access to these vaccines uh, that this conversation with some of our nation's top health experts will give you the information you need to move from outbreak to understanding. Uh, it is also Women's History Month and we have the tremendous honor of having the leading Black woman scientist in the United States, Dr. Kismikia Corbett on the webinar, uh, honored by what I call our nation's new uncle, Dr. Anthony Fauci. As one of uh, Time Magazine's 100 emerging leaders shaping our future, very simply, Dr. Corbett is a trailblazer. She's being written in history books right now. She's the epitome of Black girl magic lighting the way for all of the world right now in the face of this really scary pandemic. She helped design the very vaccine that my mama will be getting at 1.30 today, the Moderna vaccine. And her work is very simply saving lives and saving livelihoods. Um, she's showing us the way and she's showing the way for the next generation of women scientists who will blaze a trail in our future. So I wanted to give you all a brief breakdown on the flow of today's conversation. We're going to start with a brief word from North Carolina State University historian, Dr. Blair Kelly, and one of Peace's own, of course. And she's going to speak briefly about the importance of women's history. And that will be followed by a conversation with Dr. Corbett and a Q&A with uh, questions, again, that you all sent in. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Corbett and then two wonderful Duke physicians and faculty members Dr. Jensen Hall and Dr. Lance Okeke. So, uh, Dr. Kelly? Good morning, everybody. Here at Peace Missionary Baptist Church, we are accustomed to celebrating Black History Month. And in fact, we celebrate Black history throughout each year, both through our faith and song. So the planning committee here at Peace thought it would be fun this year to add a new element to the mix and celebrate Women's History Month to remind ourselves of the accomplishments of women throughout the years to our culture and society. From science to politics, it's a chance to reflect on the trailblazing women who led the way for change. We know along with men, black women have led the way throughout our history, fighting for our freedom from bondage, fighting for our civil rights. Black women have been trailblazers in every field from boardrooms to the halls of Congress. We've been educators and mentors, building the legacy that will strengthen us for the future. This year, we had the awesome opportunity to see a black woman elected to the second highest office in the land, a reminder that there are no limitations on what we can do. I am thrilled today that we will have the opportunity to host Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, a black woman trailblazer in science. Surely she has one of the busiest schedules in the world and yet she has not forgotten her roots. She is taking time to talk with us about her journey as a scientist and to provide us with the guidance and wisdom we need to come out on the other side of this global crisis. And she's a model for all women, a reminder to do the work in every aspect of your life, a reminder of all the ways that black women continue to lead. Thank you so much. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. All right, it's time to bring in our guest of honor, Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. 
is a viral immunologist at the United States National Institutes of Health, also known as NIH. She's one of the scientists who in early 2020 helped to develop an mRNA-based vaccine for COVID-19. It was developed in collaboration with biotech firm Moderna, and the vaccine is now one of three being distributed across the U.S., including all over North Carolina. She received a BS in biological sciences with a double major in sociology in 2008 from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she was a Meyerhoff scholar and an NIH undergraduate scholar. She then went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a Tar Heel, where she obtained her PhD in microbiology and immunology in 2014. She's a North Carolinian, she's a trailblazer, she's a woman of faith. And Dr. Corbett is using her passion for science and her desire to close the disparities that still divide our society to change this world. She's also pretty prolific on Twitter. She has a mean clapback game, but it's all about science. It's really interesting. I love looking at her Twitter page. So we are so thrilled to have Dr. Corbett with us at Peace Missionary Baptist today. And Dr. Corbett, if you could just begin by telling us um, a bit about your journey to this unbelievable moment for this world. I have been wanting to hear from you and, and how this must be for you to not only have done the research that has led us to this moment, but to realize that you're allowing for the world to move forward as a result of that research. Well, hi, and um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak to you guys this morning. Um, you know, I actually am from North Carolina. I grew up in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and um, in high school, when I was attending Orange High School, I did an internship at the University of North Carolina in a lab. It was a chemistry lab, but I loved it. And it was that moment that I realized, okay, I can be a scientist, and um, science was fun for me both in the classroom and then additionally in the lab. And so I've really just spent the last, I guess now it's been like 19 years, I know. Um, basically curating what is my career trajectory. And I went off to University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And then I, when I came back to UNC, I really started to study viruses and viral immunology. And I kind of combined that with the work that I did at UMBC when I was studying health disparities. And together, my interest in vaccine development was really sparked. And so actually at UNC, I did work on vaccine development from um, dengue virus. And then when I came to the government um, in DC, I started to work on coronaviruses. And that was over six years ago, about six and a half years ago now. And at the time, I don't know if you all remember, but MERS was circulating. It's another coronavirus that's very closely related to SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID. And it was very clear that coronaviruses had the potential to do this, which is cause a pandemic. And so from a vaccine perspective, we just wanted to be prepared. And so we used the next six years to prepare ourselves for this moment, never hoping that it would ever happen, right? Because you don't want a pandemic to happen and the devastation that this type of global health um, occurrence causes on the entire world is just beyond what anyone could ever want. But if you're going, if it's going to happen because nature does what nature does, then we want it to be prepared. And so we did research over the last six years with the team that I lead. And we got to the point where we really understood how to make a really good coronavirus vaccine. And because of that, we were able to really deploy a vaccine very quickly into phase one clinical trial based on all of our preclinical data prior. And now we're at this moment where um, our technology is being used in four out of five of the vaccines that are in the US's current portfolio and also inclusive of what is the prospective portfolio. The only exception is AstraZeneca. Um, and, you know, used all over the globe. And yeah, there is something to be said about what vaccines can do towards the utility of so-called stopping this pandemic in its tracks. And it's, I mean, I don't really ever get to think about what is the moment because we're always just moving ahead as far as work is concerned. But I'm grateful to have been able to use our knowledge in that way. And I'm grateful to be able to be purposed to do what I do. I think that that's really kind of the major 
takeaway for me as I continue to live in this moment and continue to do the work. You know, you talk about, I think for people who don't quite understand the exact science behind the vaccine, which will be the majority of Americans, right? When mm -hmm. you talk about the fact that you've been working on uh, creating a vaccine for coronaviruses for several years, people are thinking, wait, what? I thought this is something that just happened. Can you, you know, one of the biggest concerns that I hear from people is that well, it was developed too fast. I don't want to take it. I want to see it play out a little bit before I get it for myself. But you're saying that you all have researched this for years. Can you explain the process of researching these coronaviruses and then the vaccine? Yeah, sure. I, and I also should just say that I understand the concern very much so because what you're seeing is vaccine development that basically happened in 10 months which is unprecedented speed. But what was going on behind the scenes for the last six years, actually for the last actually 15 years, if you take all, all the research that's included um, in, into account is just basic science that really fueled the vaccine trajectory. So coronaviruses, just like all viruses have uh, surface proteins. So generally speaking, whenever you get a vaccine in the classical way, so for example, the seasonal influenza shot that you get every September or whenever, it's always a, a whole virus that has just been made weak in some way. So you're getting the whole virus generally. But what we did over the last several years is just study one protein on that virus, which is the spike protein on the, on the coronavirus. So this protein allows for the virus to, to bind to a cell and then get into that cell and then replicate. And so if you can just take the spike protein and give that to the body, you actually can elicit a good, actually very good re immune response against the virus without giving anyone the whole virus. And so the way that these vaccines are made is based on technology that we develop to make these spike proteins form inside of the body without all the rest of the virus. And it is messenger RNA technology for the Pfizer and Moderna candidate. Or, um, and then um, Johnson & Johnson is using a slightly different platform where they give the same protein, but they deliver it on the surface of a different virus called an adenovirus. And, um, you know, it's the messenger RNA candidates, people will always say, oh, they're so new. And the truth is, yes, they are new for licensing in humans in the US, but they're not new technologies at all. And they've been in humans for over five years in different um, vaccine trials or with cancer therapeutics. And if you're going to beat a pandemic, if you're going to race against a virus, you have to use a technology that is somewhat revolutionary because you have to move very quickly. And manufacturability of these types of platforms is obviously very rapid. If we could get into the clinic in 66 days, there's no way we would have been able to make and kill viruses that were fit for a human arm. There's no way that we would have been able to, um, you know, use any of the more traditional methods of vaccine development to move very quickly. And so it was a very conscious and intentional and scientifically driven decision to use these types of methods. Um, and I think that one thing that goes unsaid is that while it's new, there is no scientific integrity or safety or anything of that nature that's compromised. And the so-called Operation Warp Speed development of it all was actually really multiple aspects. So there is the development on the preclinical side. So that's what our team has done for the last six and a half years. And then in a very unprecedented way as well, the institutions, whether it be the government or you know, companies or FDA, all of these things came together and made a very intentional effort to work together in a way that you've never seen before. So our collaboration with Moderna started over three years ago, but to work together to drive a product into the clinic, generally speaking, companies do not do that with the federal government. But it was an intentional effort because when you have this type of situation, there really has to be an all hands on deck, scientifically driven and global effort in order to get through it. 
I wanted to bring in our other panelists as well. Uh, um, but before I do that, and before we get back to the COVID-19 conversation, I, I wanted to talk about your, your prior research because basically, you know, I've, I've been watching some of your previous interviews and it, it sounded like you were always kind of preparing for the potential of a pandemic. Uh, and now it happens. When you first started seeing that the virus was spreading in China, did you think, oh, this is probably that moment? When no. did you think that? You know, actually, um, some of the first reports of the virus circulating in, in the Wuhan district of China was actually in December 2019. And I believe I got a report from my boss on December 31st, so New Year's Eve of 2019. And, you know, it was, he was basically, he said, get ready for 2020. But one other thing that I, I actually was on the team that has developed the same type of vaccines for flu pandemics. And so at that time, all we knew was a respiratory virus. We didn't know what kind. And to be honest, because we'd seen outbreaks of flu viruses before, I was most certain that it was going to be a flu virus. And when it turned out to be a coronavirus, it was like, okay, we know exactly what to do, but we were really just moving by way of a drill because we had no idea that it would become a pandemic. We had no idea that the virus would even reach the United States. And then when it did, it, it was like, oh my. And then it became very clear on a very global level around mid-February that we had a serious problem. At that point, people were not, people were getting infected and they, their infections could not be traced back to anyone from the Wuhan district. So it was very clear that there was clear human to human spread of the virus, that it was very robust and that it was traveling very quickly. And that's the definition of a pandemic. And so as you talk about Twitter, I kind of called the WHO out about not calling it a pandemic. And around February the 22nd, it was very clear to me, at least that it was a pandemic. And so at that point, what was the drill to really prove that if you do enough research by way of what is called pandemic preparedness, you can move very quickly, became a real life situation. And it was beyond what was proof of concept, but proof of saving that we could have to save lives at the end. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, a drill to having to get to it very yeah. quickly you know I, I I used to say oh when we get to phase one clinical trial like I will get my sleep back and all, all of this and I'm actually relaxing right now like sitting on my couch with like these because this week was terrible and I oh. fully imagine that we will be in this level of work um probably into the end of the year at least and that's okay but definitely what was a drill turned into something that was, it was far bigger task for, for any of us. And let's talk a little bit about just how you're managing all of this. I mean, you talk about the clinical trial basically being a world record going from the discovery of the vaccine or the virus to the first clinical trial, less than 70 days. But at the same time, you're seeing all the images coming from hospitals across the nation. Uh, you're seeing the infections just going up astronomically. And sadly, we're seeing deaths. I mean, what is going through your mind? As you know, you, you know you're working on the research and there's a process to these clinical trials, and yet you're seeing a very real impact that it's having on the world. How are you managing, you know, wanting to get this out to the public, but also having to be safe? God, that's it. And mind you, it wasn't just I was seeing images on TV. At some point, actually, the prior administration stopped that. So it was very difficult for anyone to really grasp what was happening inside of clinics and hospitals. But we have a clinic. I actually, you know, we have a hospital <laughs> um, at the National Institutes of Health. And we, the Vaccine Research Center actually has a clinic. And there was even devastation there. And so it was um, I, I, at one point, I just stopped looking at the numbers. I was waking up and, and immediately checking what the stats were, you know, how many people died yesterday, that kind of thing. But it does become a burden um, on you. And in order to protect your peace, you do have to kind of create 
boundaries. And um, it was, I remember at one point, kind of towards the end, uh, well, yeah, kind of the beginning slash end of the summer, everyone was like, oh, you know, the first wave is over, but the second wave is coming. And I was thinking, when was the, when was the first wave over? Uh, you know, like we don't have a vaccine mm-hmm. yet. Um, you know, for the most part, the clinic was extremely overwhelmed. All of my physician friends were just over it and just mentally and physically exhausted as was my entire team. And I was thinking, we're just still in the first wave. I, I, I actually, honestly, I think that we've kind of just continuously had one big wave. And you know how like the wave is big and then it just kind of like washes out onto like the shore, but you can mm-hmm. still tell that it was a wave. We're kind of like at that yeah. point. And um, so it's, it's hard to really say how I've dealt because I don't think that me dealing with any of this is about me. I I think that what is God has been the only thing that has kept me somewhat sane in this all or anyone really. I think even just everyone has some level of emotional um, distress regarding this pandemic. We're living society in a very different way now. And that's actually the first thing that I told my parents when I went home and I briefed them like they were presidents. I was just like, I sat them down and I was like, what you're about to see is society completely changed and the way that we live is going to change. And you need to basically go lock grandma in the house and someone needs to go live with her for the next year or whatever. But it's like, there's only so much that one can can deal with and so I generally just know my limit and then give the rest to God well it certainly is uh, a, a hopeful moment now that we have these vaccines uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about that today I want to bring in our two other panelists uh, Dr. Jensen Hall is an assistant professor of medicine at Duke University and a member of the Duke Molecular Physiology Institute. He studies the genetics of inherited kidney disease, uh, particularly in African-Americans, critical research there. Dr. Lance Okeke is an infectious disease specialist at Duke Health. He's running the current study and is the site principal investigator for an active trial looking for therapeutics for COVID-19. Look, treatments will be incredibly important moving forward for all the people who are infected with the virus and people will continue to get infected with this virus. Uh, Dr. Hall and uh, Dr. OKK, thank you all for joining as well. Um, So I I wanted to get into the the specifics of the vaccine because I know a lot of people have questions about that. Um, Beginning, uh, I'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Corbett, uh, and then I'll I'll, um, transition. A, A lot of people are worried about side effects from the vaccine and they're worried that there just hasn't been enough time to bear out all of the side effects. Can you explain what the side effects are? And do you anticipate that down the road, a year down the road, we could see different side effects than the ones that people saw in the trial or are the, does the trial and the side effects there, is that what it's going to be? I'm sorry, was that question uh, back to me or were, were you bringing yeah, in? Yeah, Dr. Okay. Corbett. Okay, so, you know, here's the thing. As much as we talk about science driving all of this, this is actually one of those instances. So this isn't the first time to the rodeo for mRNA, as I, I spoke about. It certainly isn't the first time to the rodeo with vaccine development. And actually the, the FDA determining that before a company could submit for emergency use authorization, they had to follow the phase three clinical trial participants for two months was scientifically driven. It is because 95% of side effects that happen after vaccines happen within two months following that. Even less of a percentage, I mean, sorry, um, uh, even less time when you think about any of the mRNA technologies that have gone into humans in clinical trial. It also is worth noting that this vaccine started to be put into people on March 16th of last year. So we're already a year into knowing side effects in 50 people. As of next month, we'll be a year into knowing side effects in 550 people. 
And so um, these people have been followed every single month for the last year, and they are, not, are doing quite well. There are a couple of women in the phase one clinical trial who have gotten pregnant. There are no side effects to be thought about as far as this vaccine is concerned and the long-term effects. What are long-term effects that could be considered though are the ones that you get from COVID-19 where people who have been infected, even if it's mild infection, have severe respiratory distress, ongoing heart problems, um, brain fog and forgetfulness and all of these things. And so the vaccine certainly from a risk assessment perspective around long-term side effects, you should bet on the vaccine far more than you should bet on your chances of getting the virus. Which at this point, let's be clear, if you don't get vaccinated, eventually you will likely come in contact with COVID-19. And um, that's just you know the, the, the lay of the land. The side effects, um, or as I like to call them effects, because what you're seeing in people when they get vaccinated with any of the vaccines is called reactogenicity. And I know that's a very long word, but I really like to people like to frame it that way because it is your body's way of reacting to the vaccine, basically by building up an immune response. Your body is saying, oh, we see this foreign thing. We're going to rush the immune cells over there to your arm. And that's why you get you know, um, pain or redness or swelling at the injection site. Your body is saying, oh, let's have a fever because this is what your innate immune system does when your body is fighting something. And it's basically that spike protein is tricking your body into saying, fight, fight me away so that you can learn how to fight for me. And that's it. And, um, you know, it's uncomfortable. And I, I can wholeheartedly admit that because I've been vaccinated um, as well. And I got vaccinated purposely the day before my birthday so that if I were to miss what was my like really, you know, my Zoom celebration and photo shoot that you know, was put together for me. If I were to miss that, then I would want to be able to admit that to the American people that mm -hmm. I, the person that invented the vaccine had to miss my birthday because of the side effects were so severe. I had a headache and I had some, um, I had very severe fatigue, but as you can tell, I needed to sleep anyway. So I was actually very happy about it. <laughs> it was, it was so literally, worked. it was really, the, it was the kind of fatigue where you just feel so heavy that you just have mm -hmm. to go to sleep. There was no powering through that fatigue. And I was like, okay, I give up. Let me take it to bed. So, um, you know, I understand the concern, but this is your body doing what your body is, is built to do. Uh, Dr. OKK, the work that you're doing is so critical right now because again, not everyone's going to get the vaccine and also, um, uh, people will continue to get infected as this virus is still out in our community. Can you talk about therapeutics right now for uh, the virus? Are they effective at saying, saving lives? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Lena. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Dr. Corbett, um, for the honor of joining this panel today. Um, I think your work is uh, obviously revolutionary and we're proud of your accomplishments. Um, I also want to say that it's important that you kind of um, framed uh, things in the realm of, you know, the vaccine being the Lord's miracle, the Lord's work. Um, we can only know 50 years ago, if we had this virus, how things would turn out as bad as a commentary as, as this is of the human condition in 2020 is because of his miracle that we're even having this conversation today, a miracle that would not have been possible 50 years ago. And so I think we can't say that enough that this is a manifestation of the Lord's work and um, refusing that would be refusing that manifestation and that blessing that we've been given. Um, no, about um, your question, Lena, about um, the therapeutics. Yes, so Active 2 is a major trial being run by the NIH. It's sponsored by the NIH um, at 100 sites around the country, including here at Duke, where I'm the site principal investigator. Um, as you know, as of yesterday, there were still about 70, between 75 and 80,000 new cases of COVID despite all the vaccinations. Um, in here in the United States. And so, like you said, this will be part of life on earth for the foreseeable future. And as long as that's the case, we need treatments. So that's why we have Active 2, which is a major trial looking at primarily monoclonal antibodies, which are basically proteins that 
um, fight the virus. So when you get infected with the virus, your body makes proteins to, to neutralize and stop the, um, the virus from getting to where it's trying to go to. If you isolate and filter out those, the best of those antibodies, the best of those proteins, you can actually take them, mass produce them, and give them to someone else who is sick with COVID before the virus takes um, hold. And you can actually stop the virus dead in its tracks by basically filtering those best proteins and mass producing them. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we've gone through about five um, separate agents, four of them are monoclonal antibodies through these clinical trials. And um, we've struggled to, um, to um, recruit people of color um, because it's important that if we're, if we're looking at these as potential therapeutics, that black folks and others are part of the trial phase. So we know that it works the same way in me as it does in everybody else out there, basically. And so, and so we're, we're recruiting right now here at Duke. Um, we're, we're, we're doing well so far. I'm proud to say that the people, everyone that we recruited this week were, were people of color. Um, and um, it's gonna be important going forward, unfortunately. You know, it's just the same way we have Tamiflu for the flu. We wanna have something similar for COVID, since COVID is, is here to stay. And so that's what we're working on through Active 2. And we hope that, I mean, spread the word that if someone gets sick from COVID, contact me and we'll, and we'll, we'll get you into our trial. Thanks so much for that. You know, I, we've been hearing a lot about vaccine hesitancy, um, Dr. Hall. And unfortunately, I think the narratives around vaccine hesitancy, um, particularly as it relates to communities of color have been a bit negative um, that people maybe have conspiracy theories about why they, they don't want to get the vaccine. Um, also talking about some historical atrocities like the Tuskegee experiment and, and less focused on the current day disparities that people uh, feel when they interact with the healthcare system. Uh, but what would you say to, uh, to Black folks who are worried about getting uh, the vaccine, what, what's your pitch to them about why they should trust the healthcare system? Thank you so much for the question. And uh, Dr. Corbett, I too would like to, uh, to thank you for joining us in this session. Um, you know, your work, uh, I have followed it actually uh, for, for a good a couple of years and just seen how uh, remarkable the journey has been uh, the level of publication, the scientific rigor, and this is just a beautiful example of translation. It's, um, it's all for a purpose, and it came in the timing, uh, as you say, uh, of God's design. It, it reminds me of the story of Esther. So uh, I'm just glad to get a chance to meet you in person and uh, share the panel with you. What I would say uh, to people and have been saying for the past several months um, is mostly around uh, encouragement. Um, letting them know what powers they have to actually influence the set of circumstances. So for sure, there is a legacy in the United States of um, horrific abuses of uh, medical authority. And, um, you know, those things are actually being addressed uh, in the culture broadly through a number of other issues that intersect. But uh, what you can do is you can understand, you can be informed, you can uh, be aware of the, the evidence, the data, and not uh, be drawn into the conspiracies and rumors that uh, would lead you away from making the most responsible decision. At the end of the day, it's your life that is at risk. Um, the burden of uh, disease in the country and uh, the amount of circulating virus necessitates a serious consideration about getting this vaccine, really because uh, as Dr. Corbett and uh, Okege pointed out, uh, the goal is to educate your immune system ahead of the full-blown encounter with uh, live COVID virus. So give your body as much time as it can to prepare and develop defenses so that if you were to encounter this virus, which you most likely will, uh, you will already be prepared to put it down and to fight it. Um, the issue with COVID-19 uh, disease, the infection caused by the virus, is that, um, uh, and, and Dr. Court made reference to this, is that it's not just an infection in the way that we would be most, that we're most accustomed. You think about a cold or a flu, these are things that come and even though they cause you a little bit of misery for the short term, they quickly go away. That's the general experience. But with COVID, uh, what we're noticing is uh, symptoms that endure. And sometimes these can endure for months. Mm -hmm. Things that um, uh, 
affect you neurologically, they affect your cardiovascular system, they can cause tremendous uh, disorders of uh, blood clotting and things like that could, that could ultimately threaten life. And in my day job, I'm most concerned about the kidney. Obviously, uh, I would be interested in knowing what COVID does to the kidney. And it, it in fact does quite a bit of damage in the most severe cases of the disease. So um, I would encourage people to be informed. Do not go to sources that cannot be validated. Um, if you're going to go to the internet, just make sure that whatever information that you pull down uh, before you use that to make a decision, you check that information with a provider that you trust, someone whose job it is to study the data as it emerges. And uh, it's been said before, um, I'll say it again now, we are literally trying to build the boat while we're swimming in it. So uh, even the data that we discussed today may be old by next week uh, to some degree. So it's important uh, for everyone to stay informed and to be aggressive about it. Um, all of the history notwithstanding, this really is your choice. And uh, the best choice is to be vaccinated, not just for you, but for those around you that you love, because this is such a transmissible uh, virus. I have an audience question here. It's such a good question, and it's one I'm sure a lot of people share. Um, I'll pose it to Dr. OKK. Does the vaccine actually prevent people from contracting or transmitting the virus? Or does it just lessen the severity if you contract it? Can yeah, you know that, 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 that's that, that's a great great question actually, and it's, it's data that we're actually that's emerging over the last month primarily about um, now in terms of severity. Yes, it prevents mild to moderate COVID nineteen, but it also prevents severe um, COVID nineteen and hospitalization as a result of COVID nineteen. I think um, I gave a, a talk to the congregation um, about a month ago about the status of people who get vaccinated within the context of the clinical trials. Now we don't have population-wide data, but we have data from clinical trials because they're well followed. And still to this day, of all the people that entered clinical trials, of all the people that entered clinical trials that got vaccinated, none of them, zero, were actually hospitalized from COVID-19. Not one, not five, 120,000 plus people vaccinated through the trials and none went to the hospital because of it. So I think that directly answers the question of severity that yes, it does prevent um, you from getting severe disease. Now it also prevents you from getting mild and moderate disease as well, um, but definitely the, the, the prevention for severe disease is essentially definitive, close to 100% as you can get. Um, the second thing you said, um, Lena, was about the transmission. And you know that was actually an open question for a while. Is, that, is there a way that because we're abrogating um, vi um, you get in mild to moderate symptoms that you can actually have, you're more likely to actually have COVID and transmit it to someone else because you don't even know you had it because you've been vaccinated before. So because it basically attenuates the severity so much that you don't know that you might have it and you may spread it to someone else. And what we found is that that's actually not the case. It actually prevents asymptomatic transmission as well. There's good data coming out of Israel um, that like that, that looked at this point primarily, that's where we got most of our information about it, that the viral loads in people that actually did get infected were so low that they were less likely to actually infect others if they were vaccinated, even if they had small amounts of virus in their system, basically. And so yes, it prevents mild to moderate COVID, it prevents severe COVID, it prevents hospitalization and death from COVID. It also prevents transmission of COVID if you're asymptomatic and you happen to get it as well. Dr. Corbett, since you are literally one of the designers for <laughs> the this, uh, technology, can you, and you did a little bit at the beginning, but if you can just break it down in the simplest way for us who don't understand the medical language, uh, it, what the vaccine is doing in our bodies to protect us and why we should not worry about what it's doing in our body. Okay, so um, messenger RNA, you can think about it as like a Snapchat message sent to your cells. So it's basically a way that cells learn what to do. And cells do this on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, messenger RNAs are how your, you know, your body makes insulin or any other protein that your body makes. 
And so this is what the sales job is. And we're just taking advantage of them doing a really good job at it. And so the message that your cells are getting in the vaccine is telling your cells to make a spike protein from a coronavirus. So it's just a spike protein sequence that's sent to your body, your body, I mean, your cells and your cells read it. They make a spike protein. They express that spike protein in your body. And then your immune system comes and reads that spike protein and then learns it in very high level detail. And then your immune system can now know exactly what a coronavirus looks like a mile away because it's seen the spike proteins before. So that's basically um, what is happening. Around the safety of what is happening, so to speak, one thing that is important to remember is that cells get rid of messages as soon as they see it. So the cells read the message and then poof, be gone, the message disappeared, just like a Snapchat message. It's not that it lasts forever, it's 24 hours and it's gone. And the spike protein also doesn't last forever and it doesn't travel far either. So it's not like, you know, the spike protein is going to your brain or your, you know, uterus or like all of these wild things that the internet says the spike protein mm -hmm. really stays in your muscle and um you know immune cells might make it travel to your lymph nodes so you can like make better immunity to it but for the most part it just stays in your muscle and that also goes away within seven days and all of these data have been shown very clearly by all of the vaccine companies John, I mean, sorry, um, Moderna gave a beautiful presentation to the FDA that was public, publicly viewable. And they showed that it's um, in monkeys that you can see the spike protein just basically goes away after seven days. And so it's not long lasting in your body. It's not like you're just hanging out with spike protein for the rest of your life. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that people um, need to understand when they understand how the vaccine is working. You talk about wild things on the internet. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm as wild. Um, and you know, it's interesting because we're, we're, you hear people say, well, this isn't the first global pandemic that we've seen. And my counter to that is always, yeah, but the internet didn't exist then. You all are constantly confronted with misinformation, disinformation, bad actors. What is that like to have to constantly respond and counter all of the fake news out there, you know, talking about this will affect women's fertility, uh, a story about, you know, if someone um, passes away after getting the, the vaccine, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the vaccine, but now there's that immediate connection. What has that been like for you, Dr. Corbett, to constantly have to counter that? And do you feel like you're kind of beating your head up against the wall? No, because I actually don't even counter it. I just, I, I, I generally just let my science speak. Um, when people ask me a very pointed question, I'm happy to answer it, but I just don't attempt to um, counter all the things on the internet. Well, first of all, because that is a job um, and I already have it's one. Impossible. It's just, something comes out all the time. So for me, it's sad, actually, because a lot of what comes out with a couple of really good Google searches can be debunked by one's own person, one's own individual. It is um, oftentimes um, so off base scientifically that it's a wonder that anyone would ever believe it. And it is oftentimes that the people who curate these what are conspiracy theories, I guess you can say, use people who have doctor in their name, but they are, you know, practicers, uh, you know, they don't, they don't even work in a clinic or they have nothing, they don't know any, if they're scientists, they're like a, a chemist or a physicist or something like that. And really what the main point is that you want to make sure that your information is coming from what are considered to be trusted sources. The one thing about science is that if this was a call about pancreatic cancer, I couldn't tell you a thing because that's not my, that's not my wheelhouse. It's not my level of expertise. And if you, are, if you are a genuine scientist, 
than when it's not your expertise and you sit out the conversation and you allow the people whose expertise it is to talk. And that's just, right now, this is a moment for a lot of people to try to gain traction with their fame. And it's just causing a really big issue on social media. Um, and so I just beg of people to kind of try to follow what is the science as best you can. And there are a couple of very lay media sources that do a good job. For example, the New York Times is very often, they, I mean, they're, I haven't seen them be wrong yet. CNN reports very well. They call on experts that really are particular to their field. I actually remember um, in my CNN spot, there were a couple of questions with that were um, like it catered towards distribution, which I have no hand or say in distribution at all. And um, I remember that on my pre-interview, like the interviewer was like, wait, no, why are we asking you about distribution? It was just like, oh, we'll, we'll call you back. We're gonna get some more questions. And they were very intentional about that. And I think that that's so important. And so just follow the sources. And, you know, sad to say, honestly, is that a major issue, especially in communities of color, is that because trustworthiness from the right sources have not been, has not been proven consistently. For example, it's very difficult to tell a community of color to look at the CDC website, even though completely today, our CDC is of, you know, 180 from the CDC that we had with the previous administration. Cause they're like the CDC, didn't the CDC say this or that before, or wasn't the CDC directed by a Republican or like all of these things. And yes, but times change. And the truth of the matter is that the intention behind the current administration's portfolio of whether it be CDC, NIH, FDA is for the good. And it is something that of course, trust comes over time, but you really do start to have to understand that with all things that is happening right, that are happening right now, is a large influence by the task force, which are who are experts, and um, what the CDC says around regulations are clearly driven by data, as was just mentioned. For example, the CDC said, "Oh, you know, if you're vaccinated, you can be in the company of other vaccinated people without a mask." And the reason why is because of what he just said around. We're, it's very clear that vaccinated people are not transmitting the virus um, to any real extent. Uh, Dr. Hall, why do you think that this virus has been so devastating to the Black community? What is it about the dynamics of the Black community, the uh, perhaps where Black people are working? Uh, why has it been so hard for us? Yeah. So um, I think that um, you can you can think of it in a few ways. Um, the the broad scheme is that uh, the, the pressure applied by this pandemic and the governmental mishandling of how uh, large populations with resources usually approach dealing with things like this. Um, this whole circumstance has really exposed the cracks in our system. It's been a stress test of sorts. So if you've ever been to the hospital and had a stress test to look at your heart and how it's functioning, they will make you do a certain amount of work to put a demand on your heart. And if there's a problem, say a blockage and a blood flow to the heart in some area, um, that will manifest as a change in the performance of the heart. You will get pain or you will see a change in the, the, uh, the readout, the electric heart rate gram. That has sort of happened from a sociologic standpoint. And I think because of the long history of neglect and targeted abuses that the uh, African-American population has suffered, it has not only affected them economically, um, it has also affected them in terms of the way that they are willing to embrace and trust the idea of a um, of a unified democracy working in a certain direction of the general public good. So 
they are uh, they are sort of met with a challenge that they are the least equipped to deal with. You have people who are uh, limited in resources to varying degrees, but clearly more so limited than other eth ethnic groups. You have people who tend to have more comorbid, comorbid disease, so diabetes, hypertension, things that would make you at a higher risk for getting the worst uh, outcomes of COVID-19 infection. And um, then you have sort of an inability to uh, do the things practically that you would need to do to protect yourself. At, at the very beginning of this, when masks were in short supply and we were being encouraged to not buy them because we wanted to make sure that what was available could be used in the hospital setting, um, it was very expensive. You couldn't go to your local pharmacy and pick up a box of masks uh, as cheaply as you could, you could do right now. Um, and so for a person that has to go to work in an environment where they have to encounter a lot of people who are not wearing masks and not attending to just basic public health um, and courteous interaction with people, um, it, sets, it puts them at risk. And you layer on top of that um, all of the, the socioeconomic uh, factors that come into play around you know, access to transportation, access to food resources, access to clean water, access uh, to, to healthcare um, that are all deficient in the African-American community. Um, it creates a paranoia, it creates a sense of mistrust, uh, like understandably in people. And so even uh, uh, physicians and uh, other you know, kind of allied health providers and, and the like, that would try to make a point of educating people against the tide. Um, they were just they were just reluctant. They were they were scared, and still are. And so um, it has it's it's captured our vulnerability in all of the ways that our vulnerabilities exist, and it has mm -hmm. exposed it. And so for uh, for people who are looking to correct this situation long term, you have to think about. Uh, one, that if any group of us is that impacted by the virus, all of us are impacted by the virus. Every immune system that the virus encounters is in a way an education for the virus. It changes its code so that it can adapt to the stress of the environment. The goal is not necessarily the virus doesn't want to kill you. It just wants to replicate and it incorporates these changes in its genetic code to better serve that purpose, to better transmit between hosts and to better survive certain immune attacks. So we get these variants that are stronger and better at moving from person to person. And so they can affect spread more broadly. Um, mm -hmm. So, your attention has to be in a circumstance like this to the people who are the most vulnerable. And once you have sufficiently corrected uh, that vulnerability to protect them from uh, the worst outcomes of the disease, to protect them just from infection in general, um, then you can build out and see, you know, at a, at a population level, how do we fully stamp this out? But without addressing those core issues, you are looking at a, a situation that is gonna drag out uh, for, for quite a bit of time going forward. And you also have to consider that the political environment for a variety of other reasons just did not serve the interest of building trust in people who were, uh, who were uh, in marginalized groups. So it's not just African-Americans, it's Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, um, people who are, um, who in this past five years have been not just structurally uh, targeted, but have been the target of rhetoric, violent rhetoric, from the uh, the the podium of the the president of the United States. Um, everybody's everybody's uh, antennas went up, and they just got concerned about um, what the fallout would be from even a measure that um, was helpful to them uh, long term. So there's a lot to still overcome in that regard. But I think uh, that that issue of why these marginalized groups, particularly African-Americans have been so vulnerable um, dates back uh, 
centuries uh, into the history of uh, African Americans in this country. Uh, you raised so many incredible points there. Um, Dr. OKK, you know, I recently interviewed um, Dr. Giselle Corby Smith at UNC, who works in uh, equity in public health. And she coined the term vaccine deliberation instead of vaccine hesitancy, particularly when it comes to communities of color, basically saying that what she's seeing now is that people, are, people of color are basically waiting uh, and seeing what's going to happen, the watch and wait. But how urgent is it that people get the vaccine when you do have the potential for mutations of this virus? Is it important that we get on it now as opposed to waiting and waiting if this virus could potentially change? Yeah, Lena, I'm so glad you, about the second part of your question and how you framed that, that the getting past the hesitancy and deliberation and emphasizing the second part of the, I think is not as well understood by the populace, which is, this is a time sensitive issue. We don't actually have time to wait. We actually have examples in this hemisphere right now of the consequence of waiting, or in their case, the consequence of not having vaccine quickly enough. It's called Brazil. Anyone Google coronavirus in Brazil right now, and it will come very clear to you that what's happening in Brazil is a potential story for the rest of the world and a cautionary tale in that literally a newly mutated virus that was localized in one city in Brazil, in Manaus, in the Amazon, has now become the predominant strain in that country. And what that means is that people that were infected last year with the original virus are now getting reinfected and dying from a different form of the virus. And so if you look at the Brazilian curve, it's very unique. The, the, the pandemic now in Brazil is worse than it's ever been at any point in time since the beginning of this. Basically the virus is running through their population for a second time. That can happen here if we don't get vaccinated quickly enough because the more people that get infected, the more chance for mutations, the more potential susceptible people that can get this, even whether it be the South African strain, which we're all really worried about, or the Brazilian strain of the virus, P1 or 11351 from South Africa. If that starts running through our population, then what's happened in Brazil can absolutely happen to us. And so we don't have that luxury of, of hesitancy or deliberation or whatever you want to call it, because um, we can't afford for us to go through this entire past year all over again. And unfortunately, and somewhere in the world, it's happening um, right now as we speak. Hmm. Wow. Well, Dr. Corbett, uh, I want to ask some uh, more audience questions here. We have such good ones. Uh, first of all, how long does protection from the vaccine last? Um, and as we were just discussing some of these variants that people have been hearing a lot about, um, will this vaccine protect from other coronaviruses? Um, okay, so let's start with the second question because um, other coronaviruses, meaning other SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses that cause COVID-19. Other so, coronaviruses, yeah. yes, yes. Not okay. other variants, yes. So okay. I'm other, mm -hmm. other coronaviruses, like the other six that infect humans out, so MERS and SARS-1 and HK1, no, it will not. It is doing, the vaccines are doing um, okay against the variants for, for the virus that causes COVID-19, but no, it will not protect against, you know, the, the common coronaviruses that circulate every single year during flu season. Um, okay. And then the first part of the question was, how long does immunity last? Time will tell, but um, noticing, I mean, notably that the efficacy trial, the phase three trials were started last, but uh, the end of last July or the as, last of, end of last June. And so we are about six or seven, eight months into that. And we know that, you know, the efficacy isn't, isn't dropping harshly at all. We know that from the phase one clinical trial, that the antibody responses are not waning significantly at all, but we're only a year into the pandemic. And so there's really no way to say you can do all the math mathematical 
modeling you could, but that's not data that you should be speaking to the general public about. The data that you should be speaking to the general public about is the real world data. And so that those data are just to come. So we will just have to wait it out. But um, I don't lose sleep over the longevity of the antibody responses um, just yet. What do you lose sleep over? Work. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was like, is there something we should like about? the like, yeah, just having 10 people's jobs right now is, is what I lose sleep about. But um, no, as far as, you know, the vaccine um, distribution could be better, I think. Um, I would have liked to have gotten about half of America vaccinated by now. That would have been great. Um, you know, those kinds of things. I lose sleep over the new experiments that we're doing because as we talk about the variations of the COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, we are um, now in the clinic with a variation of the vaccine that uses a sequence of those spike proteins. And so my team is responsible for the preclinical, the FDA package for all the animal studies. And um, so basically it's almost like I'm repeating what I did last year. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're losing sleep about, but, but not really any data, which is fortunate because to be fair, there could have been a million things that could go wrong with the first inhuman vaccine um, product, just like any other thing. And science is one of those things where failure is actually more prominent than success, fairly speaking. And so um, I'm grateful that I only lose sleep around new data as opposed to failed, failed experiments. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up because I think it's really important what you just said. And I want to make sure that folks heard it, that you all are still essentially not monitoring as closely as during the trial, but you're still monitoring those people who were part of the trial, right? I mean, you're fine. You're, you're still hearing about yeah, what's each, happening to their bodies. Absolutely. Each of the clinical trials, it has two-year follow-up. So the phase one clinical trial participants are followed for two years, the phase all the way to the phase two and the phase three. So, you know, you get signals that allow you to move to the next step. So in a phase one clinical trial, for example, is 50 people and you get a safety signal in about, you know, seven, eight weeks or something like that. And then you can go to a phase two, but it doesn't stop the trial. People continue to be monitored in the same way for the phase three clinical trial. Sure. Many of the placebo, people that got placebo, which means just salt water rather than the vaccine, they were unblinded and they then got the vaccine. So we are, but we're still able to test immune responses in all of these people for the duration of the next two years, because that's what they signed up for when they were, when they, when they gave consent to be in the clinical trial. So, um, you know, it's not like, the data is going to be immediately transferred to the FDA or anything like that, um, you know, to get emergency use authorization again. But we certainly do follow those people. And um, while it is the company's decisions, whether or not they want to license the products for uh, general use, and I'm pretty sure that they will, um, those are the types of data that go into that, like the long-term follow-up data. Uh, where do you see us in the timeline for getting a vaccine to children, Dr. Corbett? So the um, pediatric trials, um, not pediatric, the, so let's see. Yeah, the pediatric trials, the, the, the 12 year old bracket. So 12 through 18 for Moderna and 12 through 16 for, for Pfizer are completely enrolled. So that's good. Um, and uh, we expect that the timeline will be the same for the adults. So after you get complete enrollment, there's about a six week wait time before you have data that can be going to the FDA for emergency use in children. And both Pfizer and Moderna have um, now proclaimed that they will be giving, um, having a trial in people that are younger, younger than 12 years old. And so, you know, as time passes, we'll start to see people that are teenagers and um, less than 12 years old get the vaccine. I imagine by the end of the summer for the 12 year old bracket and then later into the fall for the people that are younger than 12 years old. We have heard 
And I think the World Health Organization um, has stepped back from, from telling pregnant women not to get the vaccine. Can you tell us, can, <laughs> you roll your eyes twice, can pregnant women get a vaccine? Um, I think you should have one of the physicians talk about that. Okay. Um, Dr. Okay, okay. Yes, um, um, yeah, there is no um, definitive evidence that the vaccine is unsafe in pregnant women. So, um, of course, the, 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 the advice right now is that you speak to your um, perinatal physician, your obstetrician about the, the risk and benefits about um, potential vaccination. Um, if you are my patient, I'll tell you, go ahead and do it. I've advised pregnant women, many pregnant women in my clinic to go ahead and do it. But I mean, some obstetricians may have different opinions. There's, there's, there's enough um, equivocation in the evidence right now, where is a conversation you want to have with your provider. However, in my assessment of all the evidence thus far, my personal opinion is if you're pregnant, you should get the vaccine. Absolutely. And if you're pregnant okay. and you get the vaccine, there's evidence that you pass that those antibodies onto your baby. Yep. Um, and there's also now evidence that if you get COVID while you're pregnant, you can also... Um, well, towards the latter parts of your pregnancy, you could also pass COVID to your child. Um, so, mm. you know, it is a it is an individual risk assessment, just like any other health choice. But my friends who are pregnant, because like, who's 35, who doesn't have like 10 friends that got pregnant during a pandemic? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, I was just thinking like, oh my God, this is the year of baby showers. Um, yes. But yeah, all of my friends It's, expensive who, um, year. <laughs> it's very expensive. All of my friends who got pregnant during the pandemic are getting their vaccines. Um, and you know, well, you know, women who were in the phase, a couple of women that were in the phase one clinical trial got pregnant. Um, I, I would, you know, I don't, I don't give medical advice because I'm not a physician, but I think the advice okay. that you just heard was one that is relevant across all people. Okay, that's really important to know. Uh, Dr. Hall, let's talk about moving forward because we've been hearing a lot about uh, herd immunity. I heard Dr. Corbett talk about, uh, call it population immunity, and I hadn't heard it that way. And I'm like, why don't we call it population immunity? That's so much better than herd immunity to me, uh, for people to understand. But uh, in terms of population immunity, where do we have to get to? How many people need to be vaccinated percentage-wise for us to get to some level of normalcy? And so, by when? Yeah. Uh, so the by when is as soon as possible. Uh, the percentage would be roughly 70% of the population that we would like to see vaccinated to achieve what's called herd immunity. And that really comes, that, that terminology comes from uh, the way that science is done. Obviously, we do the work in animals. And so we're, as we're studying concepts like immunity and so on, we're speaking about you know, herds or large groups of animals that we're observing in these, these types of scientific exercises. But the point is, is that, um, you know, Dr. Corbett referenced a, a few things that keep her awake at night. One of the things that keeps me awake at night is uh, the scenario like what uh, Dr. Okeke mentioned in Brazil, the, the, the potential for uh, a virus to linger, the virus to linger in a population for so long uh, that it becomes actually better able to do what it does, better able to transmit, better able to, um, to, to injure host tissue. And um, what we seem to have lingering um, after the pre previous five years of political wrangling is a resistance among a not insignificant group of people to taking the, the vaccine as some sort of extension of the political uh, discourse, or the, the political um, uh, point of view. Uh, on the right. And that keeps me up because obviously if you have a small group of people who are circulating this and giving the virus an opportunity to, uh, to change and adapt, um, it, it could be worse for the rest of us. So that's what, uh, that's what I would say to anyone who's waffling about it, to anyone who still has some um, uncertainty, even after hearing and seeing uh, one of the lead scientists who uh, generated the vaccine, uh, who just happens to be an African-American woman, um, uh, if you're wondering about how safe it can be, there's not much more uh, evidence you can get by sitting and waiting. You have to go and get 
vaccinated. It is not just for your personal benefit. It is for the benefit of everyone. Um, our ability to stamp this out is, uh, and, and how quickly we do it is directly tied to people taking this information and going and making the responsible decision to go get vaccinated. Um, President Biden, I think, set an, uh, a goal for July 4th of you know, the return to normal. Um, with the political climate being the way it is and the stances that people are taking, I'm, I'm happy to embrace that as a concept, but I am concerned that we might miss that. Um, and that you know, on the back end of getting to July 4th, that just you know, having declared that date, that, make, that gives the opportunity for more political uh, fighting once July 4th comes and normality hasn't been entirely reestablished. So people who are still waiting to get the vaccine by then um, will have even more ammunition to somehow decide that they're not going to get it. This is just how things have been running. So, um, you know, I, I really hope that um, that for everyone who, who did the right thing to come and hear this presentation, everyone who got a chance to hear Dr. Corbett and to, to understand her motivations for the science that she did that has helped so many people, that you take that information away, get yourself vaccinated, and share it, reliable information, with other people who are still on the fence. Fortunately, this is being recorded. Little girls who wanna be scientists, when they get old enough to watch it, two, three, four, five years later, they should, their, their parents should show them because uh, it's the type of thing that, um, it really is an example of how one person's passionate pursuit of just a scientific curiosity can result in a time when that information is desperately needed to save lives. And so it's just a remarkable story of translation. And I, I, I really want people to take advantage of everything they heard today um, and not to just uh, dismiss it as one other thing you did on a weekend, but this is really you know, your call to action. Uh, get out in the street. And if you have to take a billboard with you or a sign with you that says get vaccinated, do it. Have information that is reliable and make a point of sharing with people you love. Can I, um, Lena, can I build upon Dr. Hall's point? So, I mean, you made some very, very fascinating points that need to be emphasized and re-emphasized. I, I wish you can just record this and broadcast what he just said right now. Uh, the first point is that waiting doesn't really matter because it's because we don't have the option to wait. The, there's a certain window that we'll get to that the virus mutates and it starts to spread again like it's doing in Brazil. Um, and we don't have the option for that to be us. We can't let that happen. Second point is, is that, you know, I mean, if you take a 10,000 foot view of what's happened in the last year, we have a deadly virus that's killing, that kills indiscriminately. And it's going around the world and doing the same thing. And the commentary again, that we're a fallen people. And I think people of faith know that we are a fallen people. It's only by his grace. This, this, don't forget the lessons of this pandemic. This can't just be another two years that just fades in your memory. Remember this as you appraise the human condition and that the, the overwhelming point of this is that we failed. And we have to, and there's the only way out of this is to vaccinate our way out of this, but it didn't have to be this way. Last time I spoke I, um, to, the, to the congregation, we spoke about Australia and the significance of the date, November 30th that they haven't had a death in that country since November 30th of 2020 from COVID-19. In that interim, we've had over 200,000. Can't say that enough. Um, the, the, and so it didn't have to be this way, but this is where we are. And the only way out of this now, because it's not gonna burn itself out like people predicted early in the pandemic is through vaccination. You get vaccinated or we can keep on doing this in perpetuity. The virus is never gonna get tired of us. We can get tired of the virus, but it's, we're, we're, it's never gonna get tired of us. And that's proven, look at Brazil. The third thing I wanna say is that this is actually pretty fascinating that this red and blue commentary is, gonna, is, is probably gonna get us in some trouble in that 26% of the population, 27% thereabout has been fully vaccinated, but there's gonna get to a point where we say, well, how, how do we get to enough population immunity to your initial question where we stop having more cases and the numbers just drop. And the problem is, is that we have, we talk about vaccine deliberation and people of color, and that's truly people of color trying to say, okay, what do I know about this vaccine? What am I gonna do with it? Is it safe for me? And then eventually they deliberate to the right place. But there's another group out there that looks very different from us. That's not vaccine deliberating. 
they're vaccine resistant. It doesn't matter what you say, what Dr. Corbett says, what Dr. Hall says, any of us, because this vaccine is an extension of the federal government to them. And I don't want government telling me what to do. And no matter what you say, they're not gonna get it. That's a problem because we were all in this together. And unfortunately we're in this together with those people because they're part of our country, they're our neighbors, they're our fellow citizens. And so if this number plateaus just short of that 70% mark that Dr. Dr. Hall mentioned, then this doesn't work as well because we have a segment of the population that's completely resistant to vaccines. And so we fall short and we continue to waddle in this mess that we're in. And so I think those points can't be made um, um, and if I'm, I'm glad Dr. Hall brought those up. I think for people that are interested, I'm kind of an epidemiology geek, that's why I have my MPH, but look at what happens in two countries over the next few weeks, Gibraltar and Israel, because they've actually hit that herd immunity number. Gibraltar is right about 80, 85%. Israel is hovering right, right under 60, about 70%. Watch what happens to those curves once they hit that immunity. I think it'll be very, very interesting to see. I'll stop there. Hmm. Thank you so much uh, for those comments. Dr. Corbett, I'm, I'm gonna end with you. I have one question and then a final question for you, especially hearing uh, Dr. Hall and OKK talk about um, uh, government interference, government participation. And I just wonder personally for you, if it was a challenge in the government being so visibly involved in talking about the vaccines, in um, talking about funding around the vaccines, that it created a climate where people thought that it was potentially political or there were political motivations as opposed to the, it being entirely guided by science. How has, was that a challenge? Was, is that something that you're still dealing with? Yeah, you know, that was a challenge um, during the last administration. There was a challenge because there was this real pulling away from what was scientific knowledge to make very bold statements that, like in the beginning, of course, you, you listen to your government, but then it just started to be more and more messy as we went along. Um, and it's hard to really, it's hard to repair that kind of trust, especially when you're talking to people of color who already didn't trust the government in the slightest way to begin. And so um, it's difficult, but, you know, for me, I just try to remind people of what is the goodness of the government, regardless of what you think about the last administration. One thing that came out of it is, you know, the... NIH and all of the institutes under the administration that really put their heads together to make sure that this vaccine effort was safe and effective and very quick so that we got to this point, um, whether it be from a funding perspective or collaborative effort or investing very early on in the vaccines to say that if you get to the finish line, we've already bought 200,000 doses so that the companies could relieve some of what was the what is the financial strain of developing a product and really just focus on doing it. And I think that that is what we have to remember is that we could be in other places where the government is not acting on the behalf of the people, regardless of what came out of a president's mouth, frankly. There are institutions under which is that looked out in this in this circumstance, and uh, I think that that's what we what we really have to remember. There are so, some governments that don't even use FDA type approval and just rolled out a vaccine into their general population without any data, and that is the kind of situation that we as Americans could never be in. And so there is a level of being grateful for what we have with free, safe and effective vaccines that are the best in the world. Uh, final question for you, Dr. Corbett. And, you know, I thought that um, Dr. Okege and Dr. Hall wrapped up things beautifully in their final uh, comments as well. This is a personal question for you. 
I think about all um, the young black girls who are seeing you and see a, a champion, a new hero. Um, I think about the many young um, black college students who are now applying to medical school. Medical school applications are seeing record numbers and it's again because of seeing you as this example and the many other do black doctors and, and doctors of color who have been so much more visible and we're getting to see the really hard work that they do behind the scenes that we never knew they did before. Uh, what does it mean to you? I know you don't like to think about the moment questions, those big moment questions, but what does it mean to you that you are potentially inspiring a whole generation of young scientists and black scientists, especially thinking of where you came from, Hillsborough, North Carolina, and now you've met two presidents, briefed two presidents. Um, it, it means a lot. Um, it means it's, it's humbling and it's certainly not a position where I ever thought I would be um, because scientists generally, you know, we're behind the scenes a lot and there isn't much glory to come out of it um, at the end of the day. And, you know, I do my job because it's my job that I love and that I chose to do. But to inspire a, a new generation of scientists that will be better than me, frankly, because I've seen what comes out of primary education and also colleges and these kids are smart and there's so much potential especially in our in our neighborhoods that is untapped potential mostly because representation of what can be is dismal and so if it means that I have to be a little bit more visible to inspire a, a, the next generation then sure I mean I had scientists who were black who inspired me along my career and there is a lot to still be done in science and most of the uh, untapped knowledge is certainly not going to be tapped into unless we diversify our pool of scientists because mm -hmm. from diverse people come diverse thoughts and you know frankly if i was not from Hillsborough, North Carolina and didn't care to be a famous scientist, would I have ever studied coronaviruses? In the beginning, everyone was like, why would you, why would you come to the vaccine research center, this HIV and flu vaccine powerhouse and study coronaviruses? It's because I didn't care to be famous. I didn't care, honestly, frankly, I didn't care about even tier one journal publications. I just cared to do science that was revolutionary and that I could do and call my own. That was important to me. And so without that diverse thought, will we be where we are? Maybe, maybe not, but I would bet on probably not, especially not as quickly as we have been in this vaccine development. And so um, I like to remind young people that first and foremost is about who you are is not about who you will be. You're already exactly who you are. And I am, you know, a Southern black girl before I ever would a scientist and will always be that person. And so tapping into who you are and remembering who you are will most certainly create a position for you where you will be who you can be by way of a career. And whether that's science and tech or, you know, art, music, Whatever it is, if you remember who you are and where you're from, you'll be fine. Well, thank you, Dr. Corbett. It's been an honor. Um, and um, thank you for changing the world for the better. I'm sure your mama and your daddy and your grandma are very proud of you as well. <laughs> they, they, they are extremely proud. Dr. Okeke, Dr. Hall, thank you so much. This has been and in a beautiful conversation. I've learned so much. I know there's so much more we could have talked about, but um, we have to wrap it up. And I know uh, Reverend Sears has a special presentation for Dr. Corbett. So I wanted to bring him on and thank you all for allowing me to host this fabulous event. Thank you.
Thank you. Let me begin by saying to Dr. Corbett, Dr. Corbett, thank you so much for allowing us to feature you during Women's History Month. Um, and Dr. OKK, thank you for your contributions to the panel discussion, as well as Dr. Hall, thank you for your insightful um, uh, comments as well. And to Lena, thank you for doing a wonderful job moderating um, this town hall. So Dr. Corbett, on behalf of the entire Peace Missionary Baptist Church congregation. It is a great honor that I present to you this plaque in recognition of your outstanding achievements and contributions as a leading scientist for the National Institute of Health in the development of vaccines to combat the global fight uh, against the COVID-19 coronavirus. And furthermore, um, the expression, it takes a village, is used to highlight the contributions of both family and community in a person's life. So let me also take this opportunity to recognize Dr. Corbett's family, the Oliver family, for their role in accomplishments of Dr. Corbett. So Dr. Corbett will be making arrangements to have this plaque shipped to you. And again, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation and for the honor. And um, it's a it's a blessing to be able to be a blessing. So I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye everyone. My mom is getting a vaccine. I'll tell you how it goes. <laughs> <See ya. laughs>